Hey everybody, Matt Michaels here, and I am joined by one of my favorite personalities in the wrestling industry over the last 30 years now, I guess. Um, although yeah. I'm not going to date you that much. <laughs> yeah, 30 um, years is a long time. <laughs> But in terms of people that I can compare you to and what I've seen over the last 30 years, um, you know, you've been one of my favorite um, personalities in the wrestling biz business. You fans, you know, know him as uh, sign guy Dudley or as Louie dangerously. It's none other than Lou D'Angeli. D'Angeli. Close. Close. Damn it. I do. <laughs> I, dude. <laughs> D'Angeli, D'Angeli. <laughs> um, so, I appreciate the compliment of, of being your favorite for 30 years, or one of your favorites for 30 years. <laughs> well, very nice the, of you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, guess, I guess what it comes down to is, um, you know, there has been, I think, that kind of lost art form of what a manager or slash promoter hype man does in the business yeah and you hit it like right at the right time when i really what paul bearer might have been the only person in the last you know two decades three decades that you can think of that had as much of a presence that wasn't a female you know because yeah it yeah. all it all went that way um how when you when you thought about getting how, how did you think about getting into wrestling was wrestling always part of your life yeah you know let me address the first piece so i agree with you completely i think the the, the wrestling manager is a lost form completely um so i don't want to i don't want to let that go by because i think that um you know there's so many reasons to have one and speaking is one of them. You know, if you're a good talker and you can help someone get over more because they're maybe not a good talker and you can work in tandem with each other. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest things. And then it's the old, you know, I'm a big old school kind of guy. It's the old school throw powder in your face and handcuff you to the ring or the ring, <laughs> ring ropes. And, you know, so you can't get and help your guy. I mean, there's so many, you know, pull the leg, um, distract the ref, you know, pull the ref out of the ring. <laughs> there's, there's so many things that I think are lost. Um, because that's not a factor anymore. And right. I think hopefully, you know, maybe one day that comes back. I also said, maybe it comes back like a couple of years ago, it's never come back. But, you know, I think if you look in the seventies, eighties, nineties, I mean, between like Bobby Heenan and, um, and you said Paul bear, which I agree with, obviously Paulie dangerously. And then Jimmy Hart. And there's, there's so many guys that you go down the list slick, you know, they're just kind of popping in my head right now, but, you know, and then what was really cool about the male manager kind of role too was that, or just I don't want to say male because I just say in general a manager, because um, it can go either way. Was also the fact that you know it gave a chance to guys who couldn't perform in the ring anymore to yeah. still be involved. You know, so you had like when when uh, Kurt Henning was hurt and he was Ric Flair's guy, like things like that worked. I thought really really well and gave guys a, a chance to keep um, keep performing. And yeah. I think the, the women as well, you know, the women have evolved so much in wrestling. I'm going a little off topic right now where, you know, what they were used for in the attitude era versus what they're doing now is like amazing. You know, I have an 11 year old daughter who can't get enough of watching the uh, women wrestling. And yeah. I think it's amazing, you know, and she's, um, she's inspired by that. And so that's evolved. And I, I'm hoping that managers come back as part of that evolution. So that was um, just a, a general statement. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and as far as when you when you first saw wrestling, yeah, what do you remember? What it was, who it was, what, like what drove you? Because I, I can tell you right off the bat that for me, um, 1985 will always be that year that I discovered pro wrestling yeah. to where I was conscious of it, you know. Yeah, what? no, probably about the same year as you, uh, 84, 85. I was, I was really into the, uh, I lived in Philadelphia and the good thing about living in Philadelphia was you got all, all the wrestling was on. So everybody watched WWF and I gravitated a lot toward the NWA. It was on at two o'clock Saturday afternoons and it was like the best stuff. I was just so, so into it because it, 
and I and I look, WWF still had a lot of good things too, but the NWA just hooked me. I mean, they had the marketing right where they have the big main event one minute before the show goes off the air. So you have to go buy the ticket to see the show that night, you know, and they were, you know, they had house shows at the Civic Center in Philly. They were some of the best shows I've ever seen. I really, I, that was kind of my, my entry point was NWA, WWF at the same time, but gravitated more toward NWA. I remember specifically watching, it was uh, Jimmy Valiant and Paul Jones and the Barbarian and the Warlord. And they turned on Valiant and they start, or they, he was, they already had turned on him, I guess, or whatever, but they beat him to a pulp and they put a big red X across the screen. And that to me was like, oh my God, I was at my grandfather's house. I was like, why is there a red X across the screen? Like, I have to see this. And that, that kind of like hooked me in. Um, it was that kind of stuff. And this, just the way the characters, the guys were cool. And, you know, it was, it was so much fun. And, and then when I got to see it live for the first time, it was, you know, I'd seen WWF quite a lot at the, at the spectrum. And I remember my first NWA show, like it was yesterday, you know, as Ric Flair, Ronnie Garvin in 45, 50 minutes, you know, Arn Anderson and Dusty in the cage. Um, the Russians against the Rock and Roll Express, Tully against Ron Bass, um, Magnum and Nikita. And it was just awesome. It was just so awesome. Because those shows, I compare it to what ECW became because our house shows arguably were better than some of our pay-per-views and some of our, our TV tapings. So, but my entry point to answer your question was NWA in, in, in 80, 84, 85. Um, I, you know, I'm, and I, I like the fact that you'll go off you know, on little John's because it will also yeah. first my mind. Um, you know about house shows in general, and the fact that we might not be seeing house shows um, possibly, you know, ever again. Um, did you guys get a chance in those house shows to do what is one of my favorite things in all of? <laughs> entertainment and that is improvisation yeah, yeah. did you guys yeah, just sure. i mean was it something where uh, you would be able to get away with you know stuff that was a either trying to you know work to see what would work onto tv but more so even b that is just the inside shit that goes on between <laughs> the, the yeah. guy um, what yeah. was it like, man? We had a lot of fun on house shows. I mean, we kind of did everything you just said. Um, we improved a lot, but I think what was funny about ECW is that we improved all the time. Even you know when the, when it was a TV tape and there was a pay per view, you know, there's always parts of the match you know you have to get to. It's just how you get to that that part, right. and a lot of that was called on the spot. Um, you know, as the Dudleys were getting more over and over, and you know, we had the big thing with Dreamer and Spike and new Jack and Sandman. And there's so many people involved in that. Like we just knew each other and they kind of just, you know, we knew, we knew the points we had to get to. <clears throat> we knew when I had to get involved. We knew when Beulah had to get involved. Like we knew those specific points, but getting to those points was kind of just going on the fly. And we tried, you know, I remember trying a lot more on house shows as Louie dangerously versus sign guy. Cause Louie was more of like a standalone. What well, was a standalone and I was doing things on house shows before they had gotten on TV just to see if it was going to work. Um, because now I'm trying to get heat on my own and, and trying to do things on my own. And so they would put me out there with like various guys just, just to see. Um, right. Sign guy was the complete opposite. It was already like the guys were already part of it. I was made part of it. And we kind of just went. So there was not like a lot of trial there. Um, fun fact, though, a lot of the things that you see were, were tried at the, the, the what it was, uh, I guess, known as the House of Hardcore, the ECW Wrestling School. Right. You know, that's the first time 3D was ever brought out. You know, I was there when it happened. <laughs> you know, it was like a lot of things were tried there because we weren't running, you know, house shows a lot at the time. We couldn't try everything. And right. so if you're doing a show at the ECW arena and you want to do 3D for the first time or when Bubba did his Bubba cutter for the first time, it's like you had no place to try that out. So they tried out in Long Island. And I think we yeah. had more matches there than anywhere. <laughs> but <laughs> We also, you know, we also had a lot of fun, though. I mean, on the house shows, I mean, we goofed off a little bit. We took it dead. And so we took it dead serious, but we'd rib each other outside. We'd, we'd have fun. You know, it's like, you know, you're going and going hard. And it's like you're, you're the, the locker room was so tight, you know, so I, we'd screw off a little. I tried to rib Sandman like all the time, but <laughs> it was a lot of fun. But the, um, the school is the school is stuff of legend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking of the house of hardcore, you know, um, when you 
got trained. You got a little training from Tommy and Taz. Mm-hmm. Um, when you first start, you know, kind of getting the idea of, I, I, I would assume that getting that, um, understanding the the uh, the ins and outs, the psychology of the management of your role. Um, Mm -hmm. you probably had, you know, just wrestling in general or watching movies and stuff probably gives you a little bit of that background, but what was it like for you when physicality had to come into play? Were you a physical person? Did you play any sports? Did you do anything or was it just like, yeah, Yeah, no, yeah, no, I was, I actually played hockey and lacrosse. And, and so, I mean, I, I was used to getting banged around. This is a little different though. Um, <laughs> cause you know, it's coming and, you know, mentally that can mess with you. I, I kind of just went for it though. It was just like, you know, the first time, you know, as the story goes, which is a true story, the first time I was ever in the ring was, a, uh, you know, I was outside of the ring as a plant holding a, a sign guy sign. And there was a match between Dudley Dudley and Tommy dreamer. And after the match unscripted or not called and not to my knowledge, dreamer rolled out of the ring, got in my face, pulled me over the guardrail. And I'm like, what? what is happening right now? Like, this is not work. This is, this is a shoot. This is happening. And, um, you know, he throws me in the ring and he just says, watch the chair. I'm like, what, watch the what? And I just figure I'm getting hit with a chair. So you watch the video. It's like, I just went with it. I put my head up. I got hit. He picked me up. He said, watch the uh, DDT gave, gives me a DDT. And he gets to the back. He goes, where'd you learn to take a DDT at? Cause I didn't know. I didn't learn, never learned it. I just kind of you watch these things so much and by no means can you pick it up on just watching, but you kind of just know. And Tommy and I were friends kind of before that fact. So I trusted him completely. that He wasn't going to break my neck or, you know, split my head open. And then after that, it was kind of like, you know, Tommy kept an eye on me and he saw me like I was getting bumped around a little bit more and I had no idea like how to protect myself. So he asked me to come to the, the wrestling school. And he said, let me, let me at least show you, how to, how to, you know, fall and how to do these things that a manager is going to do that's involved in the matches. And he right. did that. And I remember the first time I had to take total elimination, they called me on a Monday. The show was on a Saturday. They're like, we, can you come to the wrestling school tomorrow? We have to practice total elimination on you. I think I took it like 20 times the next day. Like no lie. I'm confident that I, I took more total eliminations than anybody ever. And most of them weren't ever seen because it was in the wrestling school to make sure I could take it. And it would look good because you got the eliminators have to look good in that situation too. And you know, they annihilated me. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> it was really cool. But yeah, I took the physicality fine. I just kind of went with it. I never said no. There's, there's nothing I can remember ever saying no to. Um, at the same time, those guys knew me and they knew I was uh, not totally trained, but enough to like, as long as they protected me and, and the spot was cool, then I would be fine. I think the only time I ever said no was, way after ECW and I was doing some spot shows with Billy Corgan and uh, somebody wanted to do some insane thing to me. And I was like, that's not happening. <laughs> like, I'm an executive at Cirque du Soleil. I'm not having this fucking thing happen to me right now. And it actually didn't make sense for the storyline more than anything, but yeah, that was it. <laughs> well, I think you just, that ending part, you just brought up a very good fact and that is making sense for the storyline. And sometimes, yeah, you know, yeah when you're working, you know, outside of, uh, you know, the major companies, um, it's interesting because, you know, guys come up with their idea because they want to mm-hmm. get themselves over. Yep. And that's one of the things I admired about your work is the fact that just like Bobby Heaton, for an example, you knew your job was not to get yourself over. You knew your job was, to give the shine to the guys and essentially as a manager you almost work at some point in the match you become a plot point because you know Mm -hmm. whether it be that pull of a leg or that throw in of a chair or a cane or something like that you know or that enough distraction when you get hit and you take the bump that when the face turns around heel takes it over so did you did you find that as something that when would you add it to the match would you suggest hey this would be a point or did you know some of the like above or divan when they're laying out a match say hey 
hey, we want you yeah. to do X during this point. Was it someone coming to you or was it you coming to them? Most of the time with the Dudleys, it was it was them coming to me because, I mean, first it was a respect factor. I mean, those guys were working hard. I, I always viewed it as, and I, I learned this very early on, like I would see people trying to insert themselves and not it was not received well because of just what you said, because they're inserting themselves just to get over um, or be involved. And there's plenty of matches I wasn't involved in that I was just outside the ring getting heat and went to the back. It's fine. You know, I never, very rarely did I insert myself in a match um, in ECW because one, the guys looked out for me and they knew like we won heat, he can, he can get it or he can do something. Um, the only times I, you know, I, I would come up with suggestions more so for the match itself or, and that was rare, but you know, I had some ideas here and there and ECW was so collaborative that we could, we had that, that space, but I can't, I can't sit here and think of when I would say, yeah, put me through a table or something like that. But I mean, I'm sure there was a time maybe on a house show, but it wasn't frequent. After the Dudleys left and Louis Dangerously was involved, I had a lot more say in what I was doing. So I'd make a lot more suggestions um, because that was a character that, you know, obviously was building heat and, you know, the payoff was Paul to hit me. So it was like you're trying to finagle that a little bit. And then when I was talking about the Billy stuff, you know, the payoff, which never happened, but, you know, I was going to Chicago and Billy and I were doing our thing. And like the whole thing was he was going to like, blast me i don't know what we were going to probably know like the last guitar shot heard around the world or something because i didn't have any more of those in me except for him and i remember one night we were there and you know somebody wanted to do a spot and like and i was like no the whole like and i explained it to him why i wouldn't do it i said if you really want to dive on me like fine but i'm not going to do anything you know the heat's going this way and the bigger pop would be that you're trying to explain it you know but right. <laughs> so yeah I, I got more involved after ecw and things i was part of um as far as even storylines, I worked for Carino, had a um, pro rest, um, PWF, which was out of uh, outside Philadelphia that he started right after ECW. And you would see him punk had just broken the business. It was guys like that. Um, so we did a, I did a lot of the storylines and things for that. And that was fun learning that side of the business, but all that was post ECW. Right. Um, you just said Carino. Um, what is it, for you to be around you know the that family sense um and then to see like a guy like steve carino all of a sudden alice in danger (laughs) you know it's like it's literally family i was there for that too i was there when she walked to the ring for the first time and she got it in her blood i think i want to say it was in Reading, pennsylvania we were doing uh we were doing a show at a stadium, a baseball stadium. I think it was a weekend of a pay-per-view for ECW. So we had Friday and Saturday off and somebody booked us on Friday in Philly. And I think she walked the Sandman to the ring that night. And from there, it all went crazy. (laughs) But she did really good, man. She did awesome. Yeah. And she, you know, she's built herself up to, you know, someone that's very well respected. And I think that's one of the cool about ECW is that if you look at the lineage it's comparative to um, the coaching trees in the NFL. You know, everyone mm-hmm. always likes to talk about, oh yeah, these guys from Belichick went this way and et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, that's after, true. That's true. After ECW closed, did you think that you would be staying in wrestling or was it just that there were opportunities that came your way because of the fact that there was such a family tree there? Yeah, I, I knew that my performing side was probably going to be done. Um, after ECW went out of business, I mean, look, for about a year after it went out of business, we made a lot of money doing independent wrestling because everybody was pulling ECW guys. Everyone was trying to do, I forget, there was one company that started up that was basically ECW, just without all the guys who went to WWE. And um, I forget what the name of it was, but like I got to do those shows. And now you're getting, you're actually getting paid a lot because you know, it's hot and there's no product. But the thing that I did in ECW was I learned, I learned the business side. I learned how to be a promoter. I learned how to be a marketing guy and public relations and all that. And I did that the last two or three years I was there. It was actually right after Bubba left because Bubba had been doing that. Right. Um, so then I start doing it. And that's where like I had a life after wrestling because then I, at the same time I was working in ECW, I was also working for a radio station in Philadelphia doing their promotions so between a, being a promoter for ECW, doing radio promo, I was setting up uh, another part of my career, which is what I wanted to do. Because I was in college, I did the same thing. I was a marketing guy, promoted concerts, all these things. So now I'm learning in the sports side. So 
I figured when ECW went out of business, like I was upset about it, but I knew career wise, I'd probably be okay. And I think it was, I don't know, six months later, maybe. Yeah. About six or seven months later, I started a job for Comcast, you know, working for the flyers. So it, it got there, but that was kind of the end of wrestling for a while. I mean, I tried to hang on to it, but you know, I, I would do the Carino shows cause they were 15 minutes from my house. But you know, as you when you're a professional, you can't really be getting concussions on the weekends and stuff <laughs> like that. So I, I tried really hard though. And, and I, but I, I kind of knew like, as to your point, like the male manager was done and um, yeah. you know, they're, they they call you for indie shows and they want you to drive you know eight or nine hours for a hundred dollars. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good, you know. So, <laughs> you know, you brought up uh, the uh, old NWA or mm-hmm. you know slash WCW, um, and you of course have a, a relationship with uh, Corrigan. Um, when you saw what he was doing in um, the recent NWA product and kind of getting it that feel of that old NWA. Um, you know, vibe where you had the, the interviews right by the, you know, close to the ring and, and just that nice little setup. Was that something that when you first met Billy and you started talking to him and got to know him a little bit that he showed that same love of what we remember as that TBS NWA five after the hour start. Yeah, no, he's a, yeah, 605. Um, he's the biggest, most passionate wrestling guy. I, I one of the most I've ever, most passionate guys I've ever met. Surely coming in as a fan, the way he did, he had a huge, huge passion for the business. And um, yes, I mean, him and I, as we became closer and became friends and start talking more and more about like, you know, maybe doing his own thing or doing the, like he did the resistance pro thing and stuff like that. There was always the, um, the drive of like old school wrestling, like interviews and talking were his big thing, you know, and that's, uh, it, that translates into, into the product that he's working on now and things he was doing in the past. You know, I was, he was such a fan. Like I remember the first time I met him was in, um, I think it was 99 or right after the Dudleys had left and we had a pay-per-view at the Odium in Chicago. I wasn't on the show, but they had flown me there because now I'm doing the promoter work and, and stuff like that. So I'm doing that and I'm sitting in the back and someone's like, Hey, the, the lead singer of the smashing pumpkins is here. If anybody wants to go say hi. And everyone was like, huh? And I'm, I'm like out the door, like running. Cause I'm a, I mean, a huge grunge guy, huge, you know, pumpkins guy and not that they're grunge, but you know what I mean? Just a yeah. huge music guy. And he knew who I was, which that messed me up completely. He's <laughs> like, you're sign guy Dudley before I even could get like a word out. And I'm sitting there having this conversation with this guy who I had just seen in concert and like, when I graduated college, the first thing I wanted to do was go see the pumpkins, which I did. Now, now I'm just like, I'm the whole world is spinning around me at this moment. And, um, but he was just such a diehard fan. He even said, he goes, what are you going to do now that the Dudleys are gone? I'm like, what? <laughs> but we became, you know, we're, we're still close. We talk every week, you know, he's uh, but he has such a good mind for the business. And I, I honestly will say this, and I don't know how he'll feel about this, but it's with love. The best things from him, as far as wrestling, I don't think have happened yet. I think he's created platforms. I think TNA was a platform. I think um, the NWA is a platform that has now COVID's kind of shut it down, but you know, not shut it down, but it's, it's definitely changed it. I, I still think he's, he's going to do something that's, that's huge. That's even bigger than what he's done to date. I mean, he's, he has a good reputation. He's a creative guy. He's a respectful guy toward the wrestlers and um, that stuff goes a long way and he surrounds himself with good people. You know what I mean? And it's, you know, I'm curious to see what happens next for sure. <clears throat> um since we're talking about the pumpkins um and you got the nin uh <laughs> <this butter laughs> yeah. on that. um what was it because i'm i'm the same way man that's it, yeah. i find myself even more now um just loading my phone with all of the music from you know about 1988 89 until yep. you know 97 98 um, for you, what were the, uh, the groups during that time period and working, f- you know, in college, doing radio stuff, learning that kind of stuff? Did you have any other encounters with any bands? Before wrestling or during wrestling? Yeah, before wrestling, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, before wrestling, I was pretty lucky. I, um, you know, I started the, met- the metal era in the 80s. So I was, you know, it's Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, Metallica, and I'm still a huge GNR. I'm fans of everybody you just, I just said. But yeah. when I got into college, I started writing for the school paper. I um, 
I was a DJ on the college radio show and college radio in those days was everything for bands, you know, and that's where, so I interviewed like Radiohead before they were like anything, like nobody knew who these guys were. Um, Green Day, Rage Against the Machine, Blind Melon, like all these bands and I would call the labels and be like, can I do an article on these guys? And they'd be like, yeah, sure. And you'd go to these shows. And I remember Ra- the Radiohead story I just told is really interesting was, you know, I got to interview the guitar player, um, Ed O'Brien. And I, um, I went to, I think it was Lowell Mass. It was UMass, one of the other campuses. And so he meets me and it's just him and me. And it's like, you know, whatever. They go play this show in front of like 300 people. He comes out after the show and he's like, what do you think? Did we sound okay? And I'm like, yeah, this was sick. And now it's like, you're talking to radio, like Radiohead, right? And now it's like, okay. Or like Tom Morello, Rage Against the Machine, the same story. Like, can I interview these guys? And they're like, yeah, Zach doesn't do interviews, but Tom will go on Rage Against the Machine's bus. They're all sitting there. You talk to Tom, you shoot the shit, you leave. And like years later, you're like, it's Rage Against the Machine. You know, it was such a cool era. And to be part of it in that time was like, again, I was just the right time, right, right spot. I, uh, and I was super aggressive in trying to get interviews too. Like I always thought like the school paper, you know, so you're playing the music, but also being an interview, the guys, like no yeah. one was doing that or pushing for that. And I just went crazy. Like I was pushing, I'd interview any band. And just some of the ones I picked were like really good bands that like, you know, sure. when you're talking about rage and Radiohead, it was crazy. I never got to interview the pumpkins, which would have been a crazy story the way life <laughs> turned out. But, um, but yeah, my entry point for all that was it was metal into uh, into like the Pumpkins and Nirvana and Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Mud Honey, you know, and eventually, obviously, Nine Inch Nails. And <clears throat> when I was in high school, Nine Inch Nails came out, and no one knew what the hell was going on. And I was like, "This is pretty cool," <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's yeah. whatever it is. That was 1990, I think. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I've is. always kept an affinity for music. It saved me a lot of times from just bad times in life or whatever it's good inspiration and it fuels creativity and uh you know did the bands that are playing you know now are still the bands that we grew up on they're still right. just as popular so there's some longevity and consistency in the music too so that says a lot yeah. you know when nine inch nails first came out pretty hate machine people are like what the fuck and i'm like this is genius and now look at it so anyway you know yeah. what i mean no abs- absolutely i think that's yeah. i mean you know, it's it's interesting because of that fact in almost any entertainment venue, when you hear um, the people going, what the fuck? Yeah. You know that something's about to happen. And that's, that's the, the thing. Yeah. No, I don't. Go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. I, that, that's, that's just my thought. You know, it's because yeah. anytime that I've been around, uh, you know, a comedian or a band or, you know, anything um, that gets that kind of buzz of, you yeah. know, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. And then, you know, three, six months later, it's boom, it's just blowing up. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, to tie, you know, tie it back to music and I'm going to tie it into wrestling is that, you know, in the case, since we were just talking about nine inch nails, it's like, so the cures coming through the eighties, everyone's in, you know, their, their goth look and Robert Smith look and everything like that. And then suddenly Nine Inch Nails brings that to like a different kind of thing. And the Cure is still massively cool, but now Nine Inch Nails is that branch going off here where it's just like same kind of crowd, same kind of lyrics. And it's just like, bam, that's what happened with ECW though. And that's the thing that I, you know, Paulie said it um, about a year ago, but I've been saying it since I got out of wrestling is that we were Nirvana. You know, we were those bands, but in wrestling. Because if you, there's, I mean, and it's a hard point to argue because if you're looking at what we did from, you know, 95 to 2001, I mean, that, that was, that was the piece of work that was ECW. And just like Nirvana had their piece of work and, you know, Smashing Pumpkins still has their piece of work that's still going, you know, it was a brand and the brand had a lot of credibility because I believe bands are brands. You know, I don't look at a Smashing Pumpkins album and say, that's the greatest album ever released. I look at their, I look at their piece of work what they've right. done from A to Z and for wrestling for ECW, a lot of people knock us and like, Oh, the last two years, blah, 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 blah. It's like the piece of work was insane. Like what we did from point one to the end was nuts. Well, but you know what? That's a, I, I'm so glad you said that the last two years. And yeah. what I find fascinating about just fans in general, probably, but specifically wrestling fans is you have a bunch of people who think they know the business but have never been a part of the business in any way yeah and so they can take something like that 
and not factor in the network, the advertisers, yeah. the shit that's going on that, you know, here, someone like you, you're doing marketing, you're doing this, you're doing that. They don't understand the mechanics of the operation to make the brand what it is and how it's the same thing with a band. Mm -hmm. How many bands have the most amazing first or second album and yeah. then the record company fucks them because they want yeah. that same fucking album for the next five years? Yeah. It's no diversity in that point. I mean, I, I just read an interview with Billy about somebody, you know, he has his new album Sear came out and they're saying, you know, a review guy was uh, a journalist was like, well, it's not Siamese dream. Well, fuck, I'm glad it's not Siamese dream. You want an evolution. You know, it's the same thing with wrestling. I mean, how many, you know, Raven and Dreamer is a great example. They tied that feud together for, I don't know how many years, but at some point the feud had to end, you know what I mean? And then the next chapter, even though they're all still intertwined somewhere has to begin. And I view music the same way. I mean, Siamese Dream is an amazing, amazing accomplishment. But the things that have happened after that is just another branch off from that that have kept it just as cool. ECW, you know, I, I don't put a lot of, you know, I don't know, faith or whatever into the, what I hear about, like what it was like the last two years. I mean, I was there, you know, I know what we were doing. You know, I saw it. I saw the crowd reactions. Um, a lot of guys, we evolved, you know, when Karina was on top and you had Justin and uh, Rhino and all those guys, Sandman and Dreamer, like it was still good. It was amazing. It just was now is just different. And also the internet had taken more over, you know, I think what people have to remember too, is in 95, 96, 97, it wasn't anything what it is now. So a lot of things we were doing was just kind of like, it, it, the only reason it lost its luster, I think actually, because more people were aware of it, if that even makes sense. No, that, that makes, that makes absolute sense. But that's, yeah. and that's what I'm saying too. When, when more people are aware of it, that's where I think the issue of the bigger companies wanting to make, such a profit off of that yeah they, yeah they come in they sweep it up and then they just basically lay the bones over there and take off with the carcass and it's just like yeah. um i you know i've had my experiences i worked um i was working at warner brothers for a little bit and um this was right around the time that uh warner brothers the the wb network and uh the paramount networks were you know starting to merge yeah yeah and it was the same thing. The machine just kind of, you know, just all of a sudden just blended together yeah. because they saw the the um, sensibility of, hey, we're just going to we're just going to, you know, kill off that and then make more money off of this. I, I, um, I get it. Trust me. <laughs> uh, speaking of, uh, you know, some of those people that you mentioned and um, events, uh, L.A., Heat oh wave. yeah, Big <laughs> was it Heat Wave? <laughs> oh, it was Heat Wave. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah. it's the summer show. Um, yeah. What uh, What were your memories of? Because uh, I was there, and um, one of my first. Um, in fact, I started. I started my wrestling training at UPW, um, just a few months after that. I think maybe a month or two after that. Um, yeah. and one of my, my first trainers was, uh, oh, wasn't, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. So one of my first trainers was, um, uh, an XPW guy. Um, do you remember, or did you have any involvement in that, uh, XPW? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I had a lot, I did have involvement in it. Um, well, I mean, I'll tell you from my point of view. You know, I was backstage. I had um, a very, very small part in the show, and I was watching the monitor. And we had gotten, I mean, we knew they were there. I mean, they were in the front row. And, um, you know, when uh, when Lizzie took her shirt off or, or all that and tried to distract the pay-per-view, and then our guys kind of went to her. And I honestly forget the other guys that were there. I just know she, because I'm friends with her now. So it's just like, I don't, <laughs> you know, I just know she was there. And, um, and I've actually always been cool with her. It's just, I didn't know her back then, but whatever. Um, and her and her boyfriend do like this amazing clothing line. So I'll just throw a, a plug in there for her. Just look up Lizzie Borden. Um, anyway, so they, um, so they, whatever happens, like, I guess somebody pushed Francine. I didn't see that part of it. I just right. knew that when they got taken, when they went their the group of people got taken outside, the, a ruckus started a, a very big fight. And I was very much involved in that, but <clears throat> 
and roadkill who's uh to this day i thank him for like saved my ass big time because yeah. i was in a i was in a go ahead oh no i was gonna say yeah. I, I i thought i heard something where you were um in a bad very bad, bad position was did you get actually did you get hit no what happened was i was trying to contain somebody i just kind of had them down and somebody was behind me with a chair like oh. a steel chair and it was not going to be a wrestling you know wrestling steel chairs hurt as it is yeah roadkill got there right before the guy hit me so it would have been a blind side back of the head like it would have been it would have been really bad but no i, I didn't get hit um, wow. But roadkill saved me on that one big time. It was a very small area this was happening in. You know, it was, um, I remember like it was yesterday. It was the arena, a street, and a, 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 a gate, a metal gate. And it all yeah. happened in there. And um, yeah, so I remember like, because I saw the guy fall and I turned around and roadkill was there. And he's like, I don't forget what he said to me. Probably like, I saved your ass, you know, something like that. But yeah, no, he saved me. He saved me big time. But uh, I didn't hit anybody. I just kind of like, I went out there like, what in the hell? I really didn't, you know, it, it got, it was pretty crazy. Let's put it yeah. that way. But I know I just had some guy on the ground trying to just contain the guy, but somebody else, I don't know who it was, but yeah, <laughs> that was, um, that was a fracas for sure. <laughs> it, you know, it's funny too, because there are so many different um, like viewpoints and opinions and stories. Yeah. And, uh, and I just love, you know, trying to get everyone's memories because I know a lot of people either from XP, XPW, uh, ECW, or guys that I know who have gone on to be wrestlers that were there or fans who were there. And it seems like almost every single one of us has just a different recollection of everything happening to where it just yeah. makes one. It's like that was a moment in time where you just go, man, that was something that like you're never going to see that happen today nowadays no yeah. no 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 you know I, that night was crazy because you know it was an early show it was five o'clock because of obviously west coast and we a bunch of us went to the rainbow afterwards to eat and i remember specifically bubba calling me and being like what in the fuck happened at your pay-per-view like it was like all over the place like all over the place and i was just like i mean we were so numb that some of the things that we did it was just like yeah we got into a fight in the streets you know, what's the big deal? Like we were numb to a lot of those things, especially after I ran with the Dudleys for so long, all the things I saw, I was just numb to it. I was just like, I don't know. These guys tried to disrupt our pay-per-view and we all got into a big fight. And now I'm trying to remember, was it Lizzie or Christy Mist who did that? I think it was Lizzie. I think, I think it was too. I think I just read someone's report about it that said it was Christy. And I was like, no, that's wrong. But anyway, sorry, ADD, but yeah. <laughs> but that's you know that's exactly what i'm saying like everyone yeah. has a different recollection yeah no i just read one that was brutal and i almost wrote to the guy but i was like i'm not gonna it's so long ago who cares but yeah. the, the recollection was just completely wrong and whatever you know well and and i think that's you just nailed it on the head too it's yeah. like no one holds any you know uh emotions anymore about it in terms of you know yeah it being meaning anything you know anything other than this great you know it's it's the um it was the i, I was at roger maris's 61st home run game type of yeah, thing no know? it's definitely a it's definitely a story i mean there's a couple of those in ecw but the la as they call it like the la riot it was not a riot it was a fight and um there was just a lot of people involved <laughs> um you know when you got a chance to uh work with uh corrigan in uh resistance pro um what were your thoughts on what he was trying to do there did you see anything in terms of your marketing eye that you thought that this would be something that might be a, a viable company yeah i really did i honestly thought it was going to do well i thought because billy Look, there's a certain level of credibility that comes with Billy putting his name on something. Sure. Um, and he brought me in relatively early after a couple shows. He had Raven there. It was like he was doing the booking with, with uh, Nova. So you have guys, especially Scotty in that situation, who's like, yeah. you know, no BS. So it's, and that's what kind of got me interested. Because so I was like, well, look who he's using. Like I said earlier, he surrounds himself with good people. So you had those guys there. And I thought, like, this could, this could work. And he had a lot of good talent. You know, I always... 
there was one um her name is nikki st john I, she was like one of my favorite wrestlers to work with in fact i got to work with her and i was like it was you know, i always call her out because she's one that i thought was going to go far yeah. um i don't know i don't know what happened but regardless of the fact they had a lot of really good talent there and yeah i think it could have gone further um i'm not really sure what happened in the end i kind of just ducked out of it because one i had a, i got a concussion on the last show i worked and then um so that was that and that was just kind of like that's the end of the physicality but me and billy had one more thing we were going to do which i can't we, I still have to do it with him, so <laughs> I can't say it. But trust me, it's awesome. I just got to convince him, and I, I try to uh, well, at least once a year. But um, we had some more things we were going to do. We had some cool things we were going to work out, and it just kind of went sideways. And then when I got my concussion, like I was supposed to be on the show a month later, and some like real-life work things happened at Cirque, and I just kind of had to not – I couldn't focus on that anymore. Um, but to go back to your uh, original question, yeah, I think there, there could have been some longevity there. Um, but, you know, politics get involved, things happen, and that's not – I don't even know if they run anymore, but, you know, I think um, Billy puts his name on the right things, and I think that's why the NWA is such a good forum for him as well. That's true. Um, in uh, 2007, um, you got the chance uh, for the appearance on Saturday night's main event. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, you know – what was your experience there um, and your involvement level and uh, what was it like, uh, you know, working, you know, I mean, the wrestling guys are one thing, but Evander, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. This was simply a situation where I was working, I worked for WWE from 2006, to 2010 in right. their marketing department. I was doing brand marketing, pay-per-view marketing. I did all the fan access stuff. And that particular night I was at the garden because I usually went to shows on the East coast that were big shows. So I can meet with the guys, um, you know, the talent and, and whatnot. And I don't know who I was seeing that night, but I was there, I was there for a specific reason um, to meet somebody and go, go over something that we were going to do from a, a marketing standpoint or a fan access standpoint. And literally like, so, you know, whoever it was, let's just say, I don't know who it was, but whoever it was, I had the meeting. <laughs> And I usually hang out for most of the show and just kind of watch and stick around. And so I'm just like walking down the hallway and Johnny Ace walks by. He's like, come here. And he's like, I'm like, okay. So I'm like, he brings me into a locker room and it's MVP. It's a Vander. It's Matt Hardy. It's all these guys. And I, I'm like, why is it Vander Holy? Like, what's going on? And he's like, I need you to go to the ring with these guys as part of MVP's posse just to make sure shit doesn't go south. I'm like, well, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's like, Okay. And he, and he grabbed me. He's like, yeah, you know, just make sure no one gets anyone's way. Make sure you stay on hard camera. Like, you know what you're doing. And then he walked out and I was like, so I guess I'm, I'm here. And MVP didn't recognize me. Like he didn't know I was sign guy Dudley right away. And it was hysterical right. because, you know, he was cool with everybody. He was being cool with everybody, but he was definitely like, I don't want to say hesitant, but he's walking out with a big posse of guys who've never been around the ring and who could right. get in each other's way and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's some probably a little hesitancy there. And then one of the guys, um, Joe, who's one of their publicists, goes, man, I get to go to the ring with MVP tonight and sign guy Dudley. And MVP turns around, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, everything was cool. <laughs> everything was okay at that moment, because I looked a lot different, obviously. And um, we had a great, it was a lot of fun. And MVP and I became, like, kind of boys after that. I mean, still, I talked to him a couple of years ago, his last time, you know, just text and whatever. But, yeah. But I understood the spot you're in. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're already in a big high profile situation with Matt Hardy and Evander Holyfield. And then you got to go to the ring with all these guys who've never been around the ring before. And some of them are writers or whatnot, but it's a different world there, you know? Oh, yeah. But I did take a moment when I was walking down to the ring. I, I looked up and I was like, fucking Madison Square Garden and <laughs> just kept going. <laughs> that was the cool part. But yeah, that's how that that's how that happened. That's how that happened. And I sold everything in the ring like I was sign guy Dudley. I was doing all the facials and whatever. I just was myself trying to get a job. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's my tryout at the garden. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, how many people can say try out at the garden in one sentence? Yeah, yeah. You know, it was you can crazy. Joke about, but that's amazing. Um, you, you just kind of hit on something that I really uh, am curious about. And that is sense memory of being in a ring and performing. Is that something that even, you know, today, let's say that you get the phone call and 
you know, they Billy wants to come down to the United Wrestling Network just to do something really quick. Is that something yeah. that's like riding a bicycle for you? Because that's what I yeah. find as a performer. That's like yeah. comfortability, yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, it's just like you have to know who you're working with, what what their characters like, what what they need. You know, with Resistance Pro, you know, Billy had a very specific thing he wanted to do, which I understood pretty quickly. And but once you're ringside, a lot of it comes back. And, you know, you're still learning. It's funny because, you know, when I was doing the R Pro stuff, this is way after, as, as you know, after wrestling or ECW, and I was at ringside with Raven and I was doing some things and Raven just kind of nudged me. He's like, he gave me some advice, like on the spot. And, um, you know, you're always still learning. He's just like, you don't need to be doing all these things right now because you don't need to. You know, make your the things that you're doing make them pay off better for the fans. This is at ringside. You know what I mean? This is just like I was like, okay. He goes, you know, it's cool. Just just stand here for a second. And I just stood there and I was just I was standing there. He's like, see what I mean? Like, now do something. You know, it's this is after the fact. You're always learning. So, and that's one thing that I think is cool about wrestling. But yeah, kind of it comes back to you pretty quickly as long as you know what what you're doing and who you're with. Because yeah. yeah, it has to work with the person too. Um, being out here now in Vegas, uh, have you gotten a chance to, uh, you know, hang out with some of the guys, uh, either if they come through town or like, uh, guys that live here, like, um, uh, Rob Van Dam and, you know, is yeah. it, no, is not it, really, <laughs> you know, some of the guys who come in town are usually, uh, you know, when dreamers here, when Bubba's here, we always get dinner. Um, yeah. same with Tommy. Uh, I saw Raven three or four years ago. He was here. We got a chance to catch up and that was cool. Um, uh sasha banks is uh my daughter's idol so whenever she comes into town she's been really cool to um to meet emory backstage and do some things with her just to you know nice. and i think that's pretty awesome so um she's one of them as well um that they're just good people so when good people come to town and i want to help them they want to see a show or something like that i think it's uh that's that's kind of it um yeah that's all i can think i haven't seen rob in a while last time i saw rob was at comic-con actually and it okay. wasn't even in Vegas. And I know he lives out here and Sabu lives out here and yeah. I never see any of them, <laughs> but it's not, not because I don't want to. I just, we just don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, really quick. Uh, I'm going to kind of get towards a wrap here. Uh, okay. How, how has this impacted you, uh, the pandemic in terms of uh, Cirque and uh, what's been going on with them as a company? Yeah. So we haven't had shows since March, unfortunately. And um, you know, it's shut down. Um, I'm still employed. Uh, very few of us are. So I consider myself really lucky. Um, I would say there's probably like about 10 people left in, um, in Las Vegas, I believe. So, um, wow. so all the artists are kind of just waiting, wait and see. Um, but it's, uh, it's up to the governor, you know, it's up to, you know, they have the restrictions. I think it's now up to 50 people. And obviously we can't operate with 50 people. Um, we need more like seven or 800 people. Um, yeah. So we're following the government lead. We've, we've done all our safety plans, you know, our, our vice president of operations is a very hands-on guy who's worked really hard to get everything, the protocols done with his team. So, you know, the teams that are left are artists, um, I'm sorry, safety and, and um, P med. So performance medicine and stuff like that. So when the artists come back, they've also been able to help um, put protocols in place for the audience and the artists for safety reasons as well. Yeah. So we're ready to go. I and mean, we have a, I think it's a 55 page document <laughs> that outlines our safety protocols. Um, so it's just a matter of, uh, of that coming back, but it's, it's been really tough. I mean, I think the fact that we're sitting here in December um, when in March, we we're like, Oh, we'll be through this in a month or two. And then all of a sudden it's just kind of all gone. You know, for me personally, it's been very hard. You know, I have a team of about 47 people and, um, and it's three of us now, you know, and it's just like some of them got other jobs. Some of them we had to let go, but, and that's just me, you know, it's bigger than me. It's a lot bigger than me. You're talking about shows and technical support and, the crews and everything that puts it together. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking and it's not just Cirque, it's the entire city, yeah. you know, everything's just like completely shut down. So it's been, uh, it's been tough. Um, it's been really tough for the city too, as well, you know, as yeah. a whole. So it's been, uh, so it's been brutal. I would say it's been, uh, been pretty awful. Well, I, I, uh, I want to give you continued, uh, you know, success with that because uh, you've, you know, had a great run with it and the shows are amazing and hopefully knock on wood everything gets back up and running yeah, um, for sure. if uh if fans want to follow you uh where can they reach out to you and, and find you on social media 
So uh, Instagram is L O U underscore D is in dog A N G E L I, and uh, Twitter is L D A N G E L I, and maybe you can put these in below the link or something. And then um, <laughs> Facebook is uh, it's Lou D'Angeli parentheses sign guy Dudley. That's the sign guy Dudley page. They won't let me just be sign guy Dudley. It has to be Lou D'Angeli sign guy Dudley. Fuck in Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, and look, I interact with people all the time. I just recently got back on the Facebook page after about two years, and I was pretty blown away, actually, about all the comments and everything. It's, uh, I think as I've gotten older, I, I start realizing the impact I think uh, we had on people. You know, and it's something that, like I said earlier, we're in the moment in some of those situations. You have no idea. It's just kind of like it's a second nature. You know, yeah. but now looking back on it, it's definitely um, it's pretty humbling. So that's where awesome. I am. Awesome. Well, we appreciate your time. Um, everybody listening, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, check out, uh, you know, all of uh, Lou's social media. It's, uh, you know, it's a fun follow and uh, show him some love. And uh, until next week, everyone, take care. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, oops. <laughs>